Today, we have the privilege of having Kendra, who is a uh, cardiac anesthesiologist at St. Michael's Hospital. She was trained in Ottawa, as well as uh, worked in uh, Queen's University in Kingston. So without further ado, I'll pass it on to Kendra, who will share with us their life in the operating room and how uh, echocardiography can be used uh, in that setting. So without further ado, please go ahead, Kendra. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction and thank you very much for the invitation to speak about something that I'm very passionate about and takes up uh, most of my, my clinical time, which I'm absolutely uh, privileged to do. Um, so, uh, like mentioned, uh, the title of the talk is we're going to talk about perioperative TE um, and, uh, and kind of the unique challenges and unique perspective that echoes in the OR brings. Uh, and hopefully I'll convince you guys that what we do is uh, very exciting and encourage you to come join us in UR. We love having uh, uh, other people come in. Uh, so I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, that was a great introduction. I, yes, I did my cardiac anesthesia fellowship in Ottawa at the Heart Institute. Um, I then also did some more advanced echo uh, training in Boston worked as a cardiac anesthesiologist in Queens, and now um, I'm here at St. Mike's, uh, which I feel very privileged about. Uh, so I am pretty new here. I've only been here for about three months. Uh, please say hi to me when you see me in the hallways, and hopefully we can uh, work together in the future. I don't have any disclosures other than the fact that I am a cardiac anesthesiologist. Um, and today I want to talk to you about the role of perioperative team in the, in the OR uh, and the breadth and scope of practice. I want to talk about the unique challenges of echo in the OR, um, examine how TE is used for surgical decision making and hemodynamic monitoring in both cardiac and non cardiac procedures, um, and discuss the heart team in the operating room and the importance of communication uh, and the emphasis on the team approach. So, practice guidelines. Um, I guess I just kind of want to go over like what is the role of perioperative TEE. Um, so practice guidelines for the use of perioperative TEE were first developed by the ASA and SEA in 1996 and then further refined in 2010. And these guidelines focus on the application of TEE in surgical patients and potential surgical patients in the setting of cardiac surgery, non-cardiac surgery, and post-operative critical care. So in less words, just means the perioperative period. Um, so these guidelines, they do not apply to non-perioperative period. So the assessment of non-surgical patients or to post-discharge follow-up assessment of surgical patients. So, you know, this would be the case of the patient who got their valve replaced and now they're being seen six months later in follow-up. Uh, these guidelines are intended for anesthesiologists, but really for all physicians who are using TEE in the perioperative setting. So that would include cardiologists, surgeons, and intensivists. Uh, but for the most part, perioperative echo um, and echocardiographers are made up of anesthesiologists. And really, it's, it's largely cardiac anesthesiologists. Um, so the guidelines state that all adult patients, um, TE should be used in all open heart procedures. So an example would be a valve. Uh, procedure and thoracic aortic surgical procedures and should be considered in coronary artery bypass graft uh, surgeries. And TE is used for confirming and refining the preoperative diagnosis, uh, detecting new or unsuspected pathology, adjusting the anesthetic and surgical plan accordingly to what you are seeing, um, and then assessing the results of the surgical intervention. And I'm going to circle back to these uh, four points later on in the talk to expand on them. So what about non-cardiac surgery? Uh, for non-cardiac surgery, uh, there is category B evidence uh, for a few uses. Um, it's been suggested that there may be some value in TE in neurosurgery when there is risk um, of venous air embolism, especially in the seating position. Uh, in orthopedic surgery for the assessment of intracardiac emboli that occurs during cementing. Uh, into vascular surgery for the assessment of wall motion abnormalities, uh, and that particularly occurs during supraceliac clamping. But in general, though, it's strongly agreed upon that TE should be used when there is persistent unexplained hypoxia or hypotension, and the echo is used um, to detect ASDs, myocardial ischemia, hypovolemia, 
thrombotic events, pericardial effusion, tamponade, and intrapulmonary emboli. Um, and to me, this falls into the category of rescue TE. Uh, so your patients, they're not doing well, you don't know why, um, and you're uh, utilizing TE not only to aid with the diagnosis, but to guide your management and determine the success of your intervention. An example that um, TE has really helped in the recess is, say, for your pa uh, patient that has SAM and dynamic outflow tract obstruction. Um, so, you know, you, the scenario is you have a patient, they are rapidly deteriorating, uh, their peri-arrest, their end tidal CO2 is going down, you grab the epi, you're starting to give epi, things are not getting better, um, you don't know why, you put the echo probe in, you see that they have some dynamic outflow tract obstruction, and you realize that epi is actually the wrong uh, intervention, and you probably should be giving something like Esmol to slow them down, decrease contractility, fill them up, increase that afterload, um, but intuitively, when a patient is not doing well, probably as well will not be the person that you grab. And you wouldn't know that that is the right thing to do um, unless if you had TEE. Uh, if you have time, I'll share some fun TEEs that I've done in the UR for non-cardiac cases uh, where TEE has really made the difference uh, during that resuscitation and hemodynamic management. But for the most part, I'll be talking about TEE in the cardiac OR. Um, before I do that, though, I just want to explain who performs perioperative echo. Uh, just a little bit of history, uh, bear with me. Uh, so I mentioned the SCA, so the SCA Task Force, that's the Society of Cardiovascular Anesthesia. Their statement is that they believe that physician proficiency in the use of perioperative TE is of paramount importance. And they created the perioperative transesophageal echo exam, the PTE exam. And this established the benchmark um, for knowledge in this modality. And the first exam was conducted in 1998. Also that year, the National Board of Echocardiography was formed and the MBE was composed of leaders in echo from both cardiology, which is represented by the ASC, uh, and uh, anesthesiology, which was represented by the SCA. And the MBE, in conjunction with the National Board of Medical Examiners was responsible for the structure and administration of both the um, ASC exam and the PTE exam. And this occurred in 2001 for the ASC exam and 2004 for the PTE exam. And requirements for certification include passing the exam, uh, documented training in echocardiography, so completing a fellowship, um, and independent performance of a minimum number of procedures, and a, a 10 year recertification. Uh, so with that said, cardiac anesthesiologists today will have their PTE uh, certification by the NBE, and that's the standard of care. So what are the, some of the unique challenges of echo in the OR? <clears throat> a big difference of perioperative echo is the place that the TE is happening. And for those of you who have spent time in the operating room, you'll appreciate that there is a a uh, substantial difference between the lab, uh, the protected space by the patient's bedside, uh, and the operating room. The operating room is a dynamic environment with uh, many challenges. First and foremost, the patient's under an anesthetic. So as the exam is taking place and you're forming your interpretation of the images, you need to appreciate that the severity of the pathology uh, that you're interpreting may be affected by the, anest by the anesthetic. Um, as you know, anesthesia can cause changes in the loading conditions. It often causes vasodilation, decreases our um, afterload, and there's alterations in heart rate from baseline. A good example of this would be uh, assessment of the severity of mitral regurgitation. And this may um, appear altered, usually reduced, when the patient is under an anesthetic. Uh, in the OR, things change in a very dramatic fashion. Uh, there's very rapid hemodynamic fluctuations. Uh, there's electrical pacing, positive pressure ventilation, lots of fluid shifts and surgical maneuvers. And this really can impact the echocardiography um, and echocardiographic evaluation. VOR, it's a very busy place. It is not quiet. Uh, in the lab, often there is uh, just an operator, an assistant, and the patient. And you are, there are teams of people working around you. You have the surgical team, the nursing team uh, that are communicating uh, with lots of chatter amongst themselves and between uh, the teams. There's industry reps sometimes. There are lots of learners and there's often very loud music on. 
uh, the light is very bright and our space is often limited. So ergonomics can be very challenging. Needless to say, there are um, many distractions. And also to note, we're not only responsible for the TEE, but simultaneously we're responsible for the hemodynamic and anesthetic management. Um, so there are many times that we need to drop the probe and manage the hemodynamics or make anesthetic adjustments. So our attention can definitely be pulled. Um, another difference between the OR and the lab is usually um, lab, the TE sequence and the assessment goes down a certain path and the report is done often offline. Uh, and this isn't the same in the OR. Communication occurs in real time. Uh, and there's a real-time assessment and planning between the echocardiographer and the surgical team. Information, it's passed continuously between the echocardiographer and the surgeon and vice versa. So, you know, they're telling you what they're seeing in the surgical field and you're trying to correlate that um, and detect what they're seeing on echo at the same time. While we... Um, do a well-structured and comprehensive exam. The exam may be going back and forth and focusing on different structures, depending on what the question and clinical picture is. Um, in the UR, the exam is also very repetitive as the situation is constantly changing. Uh, so at times the exam is quite focused, but we're always as comprehensive as possible. Uh, an example would be the patient's coming in for a mitral valve repair. Uh, the time from probe insertion to sternotomy to being on pump can be very quick. So the time that you have to actually do your exam and get all the information and uh, measurements that you need for the surgeon to be able to do the exam can be very, very quick. So usually for that uh, scenario, I'd start with the comprehensive mitral valve exam to ensure that I get uh, all the data points and information that uh, I need for the, the surgery to be done. Uh, and then in the time that I have left, I'll expand my exam to the remaining structures. Um, Oftentimes there's a particular question that needs to be answered very quickly as it will change the surgical plan. Um, you know, the scenario we're here for the mitral valve, we know that they have severe or multiple regurgitation, but there's a question about the severity of uh, AI or tricuspid regurgita regurgitation. Quickly do an assessment and let me know if we're gonna have to do those valves um, as well. Um, so that may change the structure and the flow of the, of the exam, depending on kind of what our clinical scenario is. Um, and then we really just keep repeating the exam. So you do a complete exam pre-bypass. Uh, and then when you're separating from bypass, you need to do another quick focused uh, assessment to make sure that uh, the intervention that you, you did was successful and you don't need to go back on pump and make any uh, adjustments or alterations. Um, and you're relaying this information back and forth to the surgeon to make those clinical uh, decisions and what you're seeing in real time. And then you're going to repeat the exam, um, usually a more complete exam once things have stabilized. Uh, and then uh, again, another exam once the chest is closed to ensure that there's been no changes. Um, you know, despite interruptions and stressors, uh, decisions have to be made urgently depending on um, uh, the patient and surgical factors. Uh, and while, you know, we always aim to do a very complete echo evaluation, uh, um, it may not always be possible due to the urgency of the procedure and competing clinical tasks and, and surgical maneuvers. So to reinforce these points of some of the unique challenges in the UR, this is um, where I lived during my fellowship. You can see it's a pretty tight place and there's lots of things to, to pull your attention. You have your anesthetic machine that's beeping at you and uh, all of your pumps and, and blood products. And of course, uh, uh, a little bit of a, a confined space. And you can imagine if you have uh, a learner, an assistant, um, a fellow in that tight little space, sometimes uh, it can be a little bit challenging. Uh, this is the other day here at St. Mike's, and of course my fellow is having to um, deal with the distraction of me trying to take pictures of him while he's uh, doing his echo exam. Uh, in terms of image acquisition and interpreting your images, uh, you know, is this RV dysfunction, or is it just that the uh, surgeon has put their hand in the chest and is poking around the, the RV, or uh, they're putting um, gauze packs in to, to help with bleeding that's compressing the RV, altering the morphology, uh, sternal wires, chest tubes that can all compress uh, to kind of distort the, the picture of what you're looking at. Um, coming off pump, we often have struggles with air that can um, 
uh, disrupt your picture, but obviously the, the surgeon here is literally manipulating the heart and the chest cavity, uh, making your assessment of, of function nearly impossible. Uh, again, air making the immediate post uh, bypass valve assessments a little bit more challenging. We have artifact from cautery. This is particularly distracting uh, and disruptive when you're using color flow Doppler as it really distorts the, the picture. Uh, for instance, this is a picture, I wanna see the, the severity of the aortic insufficiency. We have a uh, color flow Doppler artifact going right through making your assessment uh, a bit more challenging. So I just wanna go back to the point um, and emphasize that regarding perioperative TE, it's very dynamic in nature. You're using echo to formulate a diagnosis, which allows you to create a surgical and resuscitation plan. There is simultaneous assessment, intervention, and determination of success of that intervention. So there's constant and repetitive um, uh, imaging that provides a lot of information to guide, uh, guide the procedure. And we're never just interested in grading, you know, say the severity of the valvular pathology or guiding the placement of cannulas and wires, but we're using echo to see how does the heart function uh, respond to say a volume bolus or is the RV becoming distended with worsening function and uh, increasing PBR? Uh, has there, is there air that's gone down the, the right coronary? Now we have RV dysfunction that needs support. Is the inotropic dose uh, adequate to support our function? So how is TE used for surgical decision-making? And this is the ASE uh, most recent guidelines for the use of transesophageal echo to assist with surgical de decision-making in the operating room. Uh, as mentioned before, the ASE expert consensus in TE um, is that TE should be used in all open heart valvular procedures and should be considered in cabbage. And this is uh, to confirm and refine the preoperative diagnosis, detect new or unsuspected pathology, adjust the anesthetic and surgical plan accordingly, assess the results of the surgical invention and diagnose the etiology of hemodynamic disturbances. But beyond open heart and aortic surgery, TE is used for placement and initiation of mechanical circulatory support. Um, and then of course, weaning of that support, uh, transplant surgery, pericardial disease, and uh, the list goes on. Uh, and this is an intracardiac mass uh, that was brought to the OR. This is a dilated ascending order and of course a, a post uh, MVR. Um, and you know, every time our goal is to to do to complete um, a complete exam, so assessing uh, ventricular structure and function, um, uh, the parameters of uh, volume status and, and cardiac output, uh, valvular structure and function, assessing for cardiac masses, shunts, pericardial disease, and cardiac effusion and tamponade. And then, of course, we are definitely interested in looking at the aorta for atherosclerotic disease uh, and acute aortic syndromes. Uh, I think the way that the T exam and the OR is approached, um, it can be broken down into two different conversations. Um, you know, you have your elected and, and elective in your emerging cases. For most elective surgeries, the surgery, uh, sorry, the severity of the pathology being treated has often been established by the preoperative imaging. So the goal of the exam is to confirm the known findings, uh, refine the assessment of valve pathology and the mechanism disease for repairs. Um, so if you have uh, someone coming in and they're going to be coming for a mitral valve repair or an aortic valve repair, um, then often the information from the TTE that they're coming in with is not uh, fully um, adequate for what the surgeon needs to be able to perform. First off, what type of repair they're going to do uh, in the information for that successful repair. Uh, so we'll do um, a bit of refining of that echo uh, to, um, to be able to provide the information that they need. Um, and then, of course, we're using um, any new findings to, to alter the anesthetic um, uh, and resuscitation plan. Uh, you know, these findings might be that uh, there's a PFO uh, that might need to be repaired, say, if you're doing a beating heart tricuspid valve uh, procedure uh, that might need to be repaired before you can uh, continue on with the surgery, uh, or if there's significant atherosclerotic disease uh, in the ascending aorta, that might uh, determine where we do the cross clamping. 
uh, or if cross clamping uh, it has to be avoided at, uh, um, at all. Uh, and so that we might have to change course and do an off pump cabbage. Um, in terms of emergent cases, <clears throat> Uh, usually the patients arrive with an abbreviated or incomplete workup, uh, and the goal of the, of the TE is to confirm the suspected diagnosis. There's definitely been times that we've uh, been told that the patient has a type A uh, dissection, they come to UR, we put the echo probe in, we've uh, lined the patient, they're under an anesthetic, we're prepping the chest and we have a look and say, oh no, this is actually not a type A uh, aortic dissection, uh, and uh, the patient does not need a sternotomy. Um, you know, uh, we're obviously assessing the extent of these nascent complications. Uh, so that would be, you know, in the example of an aortic dissection, seeing what the extent of the uh, injury is. Do we see um, any communications in the aorta uh, that's going to be, um, that we're going to need to make sure that the, the graft goes by? Uh, is there any wall motion abnormalities suggesting any coronary artery uh, involvement? Uh, is there a pericardial uh, effusion and possible tamponade that uh, um, uh, is going to need uh, a change or resuscitation plan? Uh, is there involvement of the aortic valves that we're going to not just necessarily do uh, a aortic um, aorta replacement, but also aortic valve replacement? Uh, and then, of course, we're defining the etiology of the hemodynamic instability. Uh, you know, another example would be patients who are coming to the UR with uh, an acute MI and are very unstable, so they're needing urgent or emergent surgery. Uh, you know, we need to assess not just for wall motion abnormality, uh, ventricular function needing support, uh, but also if there's uh, any papillary muscle and severe MR that's going to need intervention, uh, uh, an ischemic VSD that's going to completely change our, our surgical plan. And then also with emergent cases, it's important to really do a full comprehensive exam for diseases that have vast evolution. That's going to be endocarditis uh, and uh, myocardial inf infarction, uh, just as I mentioned. But endocarditis will be really important. Um, there can be lots of changes from their pre-screening echo to the echo that we are assessing in the UR. So there is uh, involvement of other valves. Uh, is there um, uh, uh, subvalvular um, uh, abscesses, uh, aortic root disruption, uh, disruption of uh, um, prosthetic valves that are gonna need replace, making surgical decision, making uh, a little bit more, or the surgical approach a little bit more challenging. There we go. Um, so I'm not gonna go really in depth uh, you know, of course, we don't have lots of time uh, to talk about really the specifics of, you know, how to, to approach the exam. That's a little bit out of the scope of this talk, uh, but I'm just kind of giving like a, a general approach to what our thoughts are and um, kind of how we approach the TE in this, uh, in the OR. Uh, so our, um, you know, we talked uh, just about our elective and emergent approach uh, to the initial exam. Uh, and then pre-bypass, we have some specific considerations. Uh, so we need to plan our bypass. So um, is there any aortic insufficiency where we can't do routine um, aortic root cardioplegia? Uh, are we gonna have to do retrograde or coronary ostium uh, retro, um, cardioplegia? I mentioned cross clamp. How does the aortic look? Are we able to cross clamp? Do we need to do an off pump procedure? Uh, are there any concerns there? Um, Confirmation of our catheter and cannula placement, we do with echo. Uh, so our coronary sinus retrograde, which is uh, the image down uh, at the bottom here. Um, we confirm the wire in the aorta uh, for the aortic endoclamp. We need to confirm the venous cannula that it's sitting in the IVC rather than in the um, uh, hepatic vein. Uh, and of course, it's really important for our minimally invasive procedures where the surgeon cannot see uh, the cannula placement with direct visualization, they need to see uh, that their wires and their cannulas are in the right spot, both for the arterial and the, the, the venous side. Uh, post bypass, um, we start with a focused uh, imaging and then we, we expand to, to do the more comprehensive exam. Uh, first thing is we um, guide de airing. Uh, so the assessment of how much air there is and where is the, the air pockets, if it's in the LV or in the, um, the pulmonary veins, uh, and the surgeon can kind of uh, uh, help uh, 
manipulate the heart to de-air, and then it'll also guide when we can take the, um, uh, the root vent out. Uh, we're going to quickly look at the surgical results. So is it an adequate surgical uh, result for valve replacement? Do the leaflets open well? Is there a gradient? Is there um, a peri or paravalvular leak that needs to be intervened? Uh, and then we need to rule out possible complications associated with the procedure. You know, for mitral valves, you have the circumflex artery just uh, around the valve annulus that can be uh, damaged or impinged, causing wall motion abnormalities. You'll need to do, um, you know, a repair or a bypass for that uh, for that uh, instance. Uh, same thing with, you know, with the mitral valve, you have the, the non-coronary cusp of the aortic valve, so make sure that the aortic uh, valve uh, integrity is maintained. Uh, you're assessing for uh, pleural effusion. Sometimes fluid can collect in the pleural cavities that will need to be drained uh, prior to chest closure. And then once I uh, kind of, you know, in that immediate period uh, that you've determined the, the success of the, the surgery and rolled in any complications, uh, then usually we um, uh, use the echo to guide our hemodynamic interventions. So that would be fluid administration, inotropes, vasopressors, uh, pacing. And then like I mentioned, once you've done your focused exam, things kind of quiet down a little bit. Uh, we're working on our hemostasis, then you're gonna broaden your exam and do a repeated, nice, broad, comprehensive exam. And then again, repeat that exam uh, as the chest is closed to make sure that there aren't any changes. Uh, these are some examples of, uh, you know, uh, coming off pump and the difficulty sometimes with evaluating. Again, it's probably the busiest part of the OR. There's so much uh, noise going on. We have our perfusionist who's trying to uh, uh, work on coming off pump. Uh, our surgeon uh, is helping to guide that. Um, uh, in terms of the patient themselves, it's probably the most unstable part of the whole procedure. Uh, we're worried about uh, the heart function now that it's being reperfused and trying to, to, to work on its own. Often when we're doing our assessment, we can do our assessment of valves just as we're partially off pump and the heart is being filled, but it can make evaluation very difficult. So you have an underfilled heart, um, uh, often with air. There's lots of artifact, uh, not only from the valves themselves, but there's cannulas in place, there's wires in place, uh, just making things a little bit more difficult. And of course you have this time pressure, the surgeon is saying, uh, wanting feedback almost instantaneously. Does the valve look good? Can I start to decannulate? Can we give protamine? Um, so you can see this is the, the same patient and how your picture evolves with time uh, it, it much improves. So this is the immediate post uh, coming off pump evaluation of the aortic valve. Uh, and then with time is now we're safely off pump, the heart is full, uh, we've de-aired, we can have a better assessment of that valve. Um, at this time, it's a little bit too late. It's never really too late. Uh, but uh, in the second picture, the patient's decannulated chronamine is given. So if you do detect something that would mean that we'd have to go back on uh, for um, uh, uh, adjustment of the, the procedure or refinement, uh, it would be much more involved and complicated. So that's the importance of making those decisions immediately as you come off. Um, again, just some pictures of us trying to evaluate uh, a valve. Uh, you don't often get the most beautiful pictures. It can be a little bit messy. Uh, and then, like I mentioned, making those immediate decisions. So this is a, a post-MVR, TVR. Uh, you come off and you see uh, some insufficiency of the valve. Uh, making those decisions with the surgeon. So uh, being able to communicate what it is that you're seeing and not just the severity, but what, what the mechanism is. They're going to need to know the mechanism if you're going back on pump. So they need to know what that uh, surgical intervention will be for success the next time coming off. Uh, and often you're, you're making these decisions with uh, not just the echocardiographic findings, but um, you know, patient factors, surgical factors, um, uh, uh, other factors. So you know, it was a, a very difficult surgical repair. Uh, the tissue was very difficult to, to sew. Um, and it was an extremely long pump run. This is a, an older patient. Uh, I think we might have to accept a, a non-perfect result given the fact that uh, um, you know, they won't be able to tolerate another pump run. Uh, and I don't think, you know, I'm speaking as a surgeon, that uh, 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 refining of the, the valve is going to result in a, a, uh, in a better result. So those are all the kind of clinical decision-making and the collaborative approach that we have uh, in the OR. Um, how am I doing for time? I think I have a bit more time. 
So this was kind of an interesting case that uh, I just wanted to share is it really highlighted to me as well the importance of uh, perioperative echo in, in non-cardiac OR. You know, it's kind of a no-brainer that we're going to use it in our, our heart cases. And I just uh, was able to describe to you the importance of the TDE uh, and how uh, influential and important it is for the pre-bypass phase uh, surgical decision-making, the immediate uh, and, uh, and even in the CVICU in terms of our resuscitation uh, goals. So I, it's a weekend, it's a Saturday afternoon. I just finished a cabbage case, cabbage case uh, but one of the other anesthesiologists uh, that is working says, hey, can you just stick around for a little bit? Um, we have an A case and I'm busy in the UR. Do you mind taking this, this A case? Um, uh, and uh, I say, for sure. So this is a patient coming, you know, whisking in from the ICU. I think they're admitted the day before or a day or two before. It's a, it's a young woman. She's postpartum. Uh, the eight cases for a decompressive craniotomy uh, for hemorrhagic transformation of an ischemic stroke. Uh, the patient's awake, extubated, but their GCS is decreasing, so we need to go and decompress. The etiology of the stroke is not well elucidated. They don't really know. Uh, this patient has a history of IVDU, so they're thinking that uh, that might be a contributing factor. Uh, and as the patient is literally leaving the room and um, in the ICU to come next door to the OR, the ICU fellow says to me, oh, I just focused her uh, and her right heart looks a little bit descended, just FYI. Uh, reason that's important, you know, as you guys know, uh, right heart dysfunction and uh, initiating uh, an anesthetic with positive pressure ventilation can be um, catastrophic. To be honest, uh, you know, how this patient was presenting, it was a little bit worried that she may arrest on induction. Uh, so I made the decision that I'm going to put in a TE probe in, uh, in case, uh, you know, she does arrest, I don't have access to the, the face, to the airway to get an echo probe in, and it would really help guide that resuscitation. So I intubate, um, I do my right heart protective uh, modalities, uh, and I put the echo probe on, and uh, this is the first image I see. Uh, so I'm seeing, uh, you know, the patient's quite tachycardic, they have an underfilled LV, uh, and then you're thinking, what are the etiologies for an underfilled dynamic LV? Um, I, and then I look over and I see in a metasophageal floor chamber how big this right heart is um, and how it's obviously, there's a pressure overload uh, and it's not able to fill the, the LV. Uh, so now I'm kind of thinking, okay, ischemic stroke, um, we have a really big R RV, so uh, is there a cause for the stroke um, that maybe I can find on echo? Uh, so I'm going through and I'm looking for a saddle PE. I'm doing the upper um, esophageal aortic um, short axis, looking at the pulmonary artery here. I can see, you know, um, I, some hyperechoic hyper area. Uh, is that artifact? Is that something that I need to investigate further? So I put some color flow on. It doesn't seem to pass the color flow. Pretty suspicious now that she's got a saddle PE. Uh, add 90 degrees, so now that we are in um, short axis, I can see something uh, up here in the pulmonary artery, and you very clearly can see that she has um, uh, um, uh, um, a PE in, in transit right now. Uh, and like any echocardiographer does, yes, I'm resuscitating at the same time, don't worry, but I feel like, oh, this is a great opportunity to get some good pictures. And this is gonna help the patient's uh, care in the ICU and clinical course. Um, so it is an IVDU that is causing her, um, her stroke. She is going to need uh, probably a thrombectomy and be anticoagulated, which of course is going to be difficult in this patient who has uh, uh, a bleeding brain. Uh, as any good echocardiographer, I take the time to try and get some uh, <laughs> interesting 3Ds, uh, but uh, really um, uh, this is, uh, the echo is giving us the diagnosis uh, and helping me with my resuscitation. And then of course here, does she have a PFO? Uh, of course, so we can see the PFO here and we can see that there's a, a right to left shunt. Uh, and just uh, as time goes on, uh, she's getting worse and worse. That right heart is becoming more and more dysfunctional. That LV is becoming less and less uh, 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 full. Um, so that was kind of a, an interesting case. I don't think I have much more time. I had uh, a few other kind of interesting surgical decision uh, making cases uh, in the cardiac OR. Uh, so I'd be happy to come back and always chat about that. Um, there's always so much to talk about in terms of surgical decision making. Uh, and it's not always just what we see on echo, like I mentioned, you're putting patient factors, surgical factors uh, into play as well to make those decisions. 
so I will say thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, like I mentioned, I'm new here. Please say hi to me when you see me. Um, I'd love for us to work together to share ideas, to share knowledge. Um, and uh, please come and join us in the cardiac OR and uh, you know get a, a you know a firsthand experience of sometimes the, the absolute chaos that uh, that we experience, but we absolutely love. So um, I look forward to collaborating with all of you and, uh, and meeting all of you. So well, welcome, Kendra. That was a really great and uh, very well-rounded uh, presentation of what life is like in the operating room as a cardiac anesthesiologist. So it also highlights the um, importance or, or the utility of the echocardiography that can be used in many different situations. I've been around uh, the echo field for about 20 years and uh, in many ways parallel the rise of the uh, cardiac anesthesiologist uh, development of a completely new field of uh, uh, transesophageal echo in as well as POCUS uh, in the uh, operating room and the critical care because um, you know way back when uh, 20 years plus uh, give or take um, uh, the uh, cardiac surgeons start using uh, transesophageal echo in the operating room guiding the procedures uh, initially was looking for valve problems and then later on the airing etc cetera, etc cetera. and most of uh, my training was actually, um, as a fellow, was involved in uh, uh, the uh, transesophageal echo in the operating room. So, you know, many days and nights of, you know, standing by and uh, uh, the, the cardiac surgeons are often very impatient and uh, make us do our teas very quickly before they start buzzing. And then once they start buzzing, then the color sort of prevents us from doing any color Doppler interrogation and uh, also the part of the airing and so on and so forth. So we, 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 we end up actually running back and forth uh, between uh, our, our day job in the echo lab uh, and then also the operating room. So lots of running back and forth. But, uh, and then we, we saw the parallel rise of the cardiac anesthesiologist taking an, a very strong interest in this field and, and uh, actually developed uh, in many ways their own specialty exams and then you know, uh, great interactions. And uh, I strongly encourage all the uh, cardiac trainees uh, to actually spend time in the operating room because when, when we grew up, uh, we, we spent a lot of time in the operating room with the surgeons. We saw how procedures are done and, and challenges as well, and we could take better care of our patients when we send our patients for uh, operations. So let's open this up uh, for questions. So colleagues, questions. Yeah, and just kind of to expand on what you said there too, like echo has just evolved so much. The, the procedures that we're doing in the OR are more and more complicated, especially with the, the minimally invasives and uh, the hybrid procedures. So, and you know, ECHO has really uh, evolved as well. So it's evolving uh, and almost because of its evolution is, being, is making it so that we're able to do these more uh, complex uh, surgical procedures. So it's kind of a nice uh, marriage here of we're all kind of pushing each other and expanding what is the, the limit of our abilities. And, uh, and it's just, you know, it seems like such a, a fast growing and fast paced uh, specialty. And that's one of the, the reasons I really appreciate it. And, and to your point, you know, I think it is important for, for both, you know, cardiac anesthesia echocardiographers and cardiology echocardiographers to kind of go back and forth between our different environments. You know, you guys are assessing these patients or surveilling them for years as they're coming in with their valve pathologies and, you know, with the surgeons making the decision, is it time to intervene or not? And then, you know, after they're uh, discharged home, following them. Uh, to be able to appreciate what are, what are those decisions that we make in UR? What does the valve look like? And then also correlating, um, I find really important. Like, so I'm looking at the valve on the echo. I'm doing, you know, the 2D images. I'm trying to create a 3D in my mind. And then, you know, now we have fantastic 3D uh, image uh, technology. And then actually looking over the drape and seeing, you know, I, you know, that looked like a bicuspid valve. It looked like a, I don't know, right, left, you know, can I see what the valve looks like? And you're like, oh yeah, or like, I saw that there's this kind of weird thing on the valve, you know, what does that look like in real life? And so now my eye is correlating to what the actual valve pathology looks like to what I'm seeing on the echo. Um, so yeah, like again, I, and you know, same for us to be able to, to come and see, you know, what are those pre-assessments and um, uh, those evaluations and then seeing what the patients look like in the follow-up. We had a valve in UR, maybe it seemed a little stenotic. We're like, oh, we're going to leave it, cross our fingers. I'm sure everything will be fine. Uh, but then to see that patient again, 
three months in UR or in um in follow up in the in the echo lab and say you know what really did manifest and, and happen with that patient and what were their their outcomes with maybe a little bit of a undesirable uh, picture in the OR. Yep, it's all about collaboration. So let me let me open up with one question that I always want to ask but don't know who to ask. Uh, is actually uh, the routine use of transesophageal echo in resuscitation. So this, this sort of question comes up uh, over the last 20 plus years uh, in terms mm -hmm. of the, if someone actually have a cardiac arrest in the hospital, oh, well, hospital mm -hmm. is hard, but in the hospital, should we routinely do transesophageal echo? Should, 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 like, you know, should we put the echo people on, on alerts or having like POCUS or TE um, as part of the resuscitation team? Like be it on a code blue team. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. To to be honest, this is up my opinion. For a code blue team, probably not. I think we can kind of all appreciate too by the time a lot a lot of times we get to a code blue on the ward. Um, you know, it sometimes doesn't last very long. Um, I don't think in those situations necessarily. Uh, a TE would be all that helpful. Where I feel resuscitated TE is is critical uh, is um, those very unstable patients that were doing a continual resuscitation. So not necessarily chest compressions and using TE to assess the quality of chest compressions, uh, but using TE to guide our resuscitation. Uh, like I mentioned, is, you know, are they full? Or are they not full? Is there uh, ventricular dysfunction that needs support? Is there valvular abnormality that changes our hemodynamic goals? Uh, is there SAM? Like lots of times we've been doing these like full resuscitations, thinking it's anaphylaxis and we're doing epi and all these infusions. And then you realize like, oh, no, 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 no. It's because of SAM, we need to slow them down. Um, I've had patients come in, they've arrested uh, on induction. Uh, we do put the echo probe in, you see that they're a cancer patient and unknown to everyone. They had a huge pericardial effusion and didn't tolerate positive pressure ventilation and decreased preload. So um, I think like, especially that I'm an echocardiographer in that I know how to image and I know how to interpret the images, which I think is incredibly important. Uh, it adds a lot of information when I have that really unstable patient in the OR or I have a trauma patient who we just can't get a handle on what's going on. Very, very helpful information. But that goes back again to, you need to, you know, it, it's, a, it's a tool, it's a piece of equipment and that can also be dangerous. Uh, I don't wanna say dangerous, but potentially harmful uh, in people who, uh, might not use it a lot, not have a, a, enough training. So, uh, you know, misuse of information, we kind of always say that that's a limitation to, um, to a lot of our interventions. So, you know, you need to be able to understand what you're seeing. Um, uh, you know, you don't want to miss anything. I've definitely seen uh, POCUS, uh, you know, used maybe sometimes in resuscitations uh, and a huge type A uh, aortic dissection is missed just because the eye isn't used to going over and including the aorta. Right. So um, again, I don't think it should be used, you know, for all comers uh, that every it's a, a kind of a conversation that happens in anesthesia a lot too. like should all anesthesiologists be trained in basic TEE so that when they have an unstable patient when they're on call, they put the echo probe in. I really I don't think that's, you know, appropriate. Again, there's so many other uh, aspects to it, too, like uh, understanding how to use the equipment, uh, how to properly, um, you know, do image storage, quality assurance, all those things. So um, that's kind of a long-winded answer. Code blues, I don't think it would add a lot unless if it's a very prolonged, uh, you know, resuscitation and they need that information to kind of help guide some clinical decisions. Uh, I think in unstable patients and you are in trauma for those who have uh, um, a certification uh, and skill set, then it, it it can add a lot. She so I completely like, agree. Yeah, I think I think Kim has a question. Go ahead. Um, yeah, thanks, Kendra. Great, great presentation. Uh, you know, fantastic uh, to see all the work that's being done in the OR. I don't think, you know, it needs a lot to, to say how important um, the role of the anesthesiologist is in TE. So 100% supportive there. Two, two things I just wanted to follow up on was, you know, one of the, the issues that, that we suffer, I think, is, you know, as uh, sort of diagnosticians, as you will, is we're not in the OR enough to get that sort of feedback. So, you know, I, I think 
uh, where where possible, you know, if you guys see our reports and think we missed it or something, I think we'd all be very, very comfortable to uh, to, to get the feedback. Because I, I do think sometimes, you know, we miss out on really valuable feedback because unfortunately we just don't have the time to be in the OR. And I think that's part of that ongoing evolution that, you know, that that we need to make certain that, you know, we understand the pathology better because sometimes, as you know, the image doesn't always tell the story and, and, and actually that feedback you get in the OR. So I know we'll, we'll certainly say hello to you um, when we see you around, but please, um, you know, at any time, if, if things, we're very happy to sit down and go over cases. I think that's extremely valuable experience and, and also great feedback for our fellows too. So uh, that was just more of a comment. The, the question I had is Rob Chen and I, as you know, who's in Ottawa a number of years ago, published some stuff on strain imaging in the yeah. OR. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are, because obviously we're doing more and more of that in the in the outpatient setting, in the cardio-oncology, and trying to use it yeah. for strain, for, you know, valvular stuff. I'm just wondering, um, a lot of what you do is that sort of acute point of care follow-up. You know, you've seen the SAM, you've seen the LV dysfunction, you've seen the RV. Yeah. What about more of that sort of quantitative aspect? Is it, it, do you think that's really going to be super helpful or or not? Just your experience and opinion, that'd be great. First off, Rob Chen is my like one of my biggest mentors. Love Rob Chen. Yeah, he's amazing. Uh, a lot of yeah. what I do is because of him. Uh, it is his fault that I am the way that I am. <laughs> um, so, uh, no, totally. So, Yes, they're like, you know, I was kind of focusing on, you know, the more dramatic, you know, um, yeah. sexy, as you could say, things in the OR of making, uh, you know, doing the resuscitation. And, but, you know, there are definitely a lot of scenarios that we do have a lot of time and we're doing, our goal is we want to be very good echocardiographers. We don't want to be focused, right? Uh, and we really are pushing ourselves to the highest standard. In terms of strain, is there utility in the OR? Yes, there's lots of conversation about that. My answer is yes. Um, particularly in patients who have, well, you know, everyone, even valve disorders are, are coming, you know, will have some degree of, of dysfunction uh, ventricularly, both right and left. Um, I use it uh, to help just give the picture of what is going on with this heart. Uh, an example would be right heart. My eye is saying, it looks pretty normal. It might be, you know, borderline mild, uh, but we're going to do um, a mitral valve procedure. We're going to do a tricuspid valve procedure. If I put strain on and I see that, oh, uh, the strain is altered and actually that RV is a little dysfunctional in my head, I am now also thinking it's going to be more difficult to come off than I think it's going to be in that right heart, which isn't protected well with cardioplegia, doesn't like the ischemic time. Um, I'm going to have to do some more intervention. So maybe I'm going to get a few more things out. I might get some mill out. I might get some dibutamine. Um, you know, we might uh, do some hemofiltration to kind of offload the right heart while we're on pump. So in my mind, I'm a little bit more, okay, I'm going to have to pay attention and give this, this right heart a little Bit more TLC. Same with the LV. Uh, you know, we talk about diastolic dysfunction. I think we've really uh, embraced assessing that. So, I'll, and I really encourage our fellows, you know, so, okay, they're like, oh, LV function looks good. LVF is 53%. Uh, okay, great. But what's the that diastolic dysfunction? Because we, we know that that uh, is going to make uh, our immediate post op um, uh, course more challenging. And of course, it's associated with more, um, uh, more baby mortality in our post op. Uh, course. And so that's important to be mindful of in terms of what is the best intervention. So let's say like what type of diastolic dysfunction is it restrictive? Um, you know, that also changes. Do we want a faster heart rate? Do we want a slower heart rate? Do we want to uh, offload this patient? Do we want to give them fluid? Uh, you know, and, uh, you know, a strain, I think does come into to play. But again, you can't, you know, I see sometimes people, you know, who are I'm just sorry, we put the modality on or our software now is fantastic. You just put a few dots and it gives you a number. You always have to understand and interpret that information and uh, be able to, to understand um, how that information is going to be applicable to you. Um, so I think most of us are, you know, try to use it as much as possible, uh, but uh, I wouldn't say it's necessarily commonplace or part of the, the standardized assessment at this point, but um, it's definitely in our conversation and things that we get excited about. Thanks very much. Thank you. Any other question? Hi, Kendra. It's uh, Howard Leonpoy. Um, thanks for the talk and uh, nice to meet you. Um, hopefully we'll uh, be able to interact with you a little bit more. Um, so uh, it's actually more of a comment, but uh, interesting to hear your thoughts. You know, I think 
the interaction between, as Kim has mentioned, the interaction between the, the Equilab uh, before and after um, cardiac surgery um, with, with the intraoperative um, um, studies done by cardiac uh, anesthesiology, I think is important. Um, and, and, and it goes both ways, right? So sometimes it's useful for us to be able to, to, to see the images that are acquired in the or get the feedback, as Kim said. Having said that, there's also times I know when the anesthesiologists have reached out to us um, at the start of a case when something is found that, that, um, that needs clarification based on some of the images that were, uh, the studies that were done before surgery, for example. Um, perhaps you can comment on that, uh, um, uh, the importance of that ability for uh, 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 both sides to review uh, studies done, done in, in, in each other's areas in terms of management of the patients. I 100% agree with you. I am the biggest advocate for having a really, you know, strong collaborative uh, relationship between cardiac anesthesia and, and, and cardiology. I think um, it only makes us better, right? For us to learn from you, to appreciate, you know, the nuances of what you're seeing uh, in the pre-op assessment, uh, uh, to be able to take that information to correlate to that to what we're seeing in the OR, oftentimes there are interval changes. Um, and so to be able to, to kind of appreciate that. And then also, I think it is important for us to have some uh, follow up with those patients and see how did that turn out and, uh, um, and to be able to kind of to, to follow. Um, I think, you know, having that open dialogue uh, and that kind of safe uh, relationship, it's not I know more than you or or, or whatever, uh, it, it's just sharing different experiences, sharing different perspectives and clinical scenarios. And I just think that it is incredibly important for patient care uh, and for us as uh, clinicians and professionals uh, to, to be able to have those open conversations. Um, you know, I, you know, would it be, it would, I think, you know, it'd be fantastic if we could come and, you know, sit at some of your rounds where you're discussing patients and, uh, and kind of, you know, hear the thought process um, and, uh, you know, and vice versa. That's why you're saying, you know, come to UR as much as possible. Well, I know that that's often very difficult with our clinical schedules uh, and often our clinical schedules are kind of opposite uh, as well as, uh, you know, we're kind of stuck in the UR all day. But, um, you know, I think this is a fantastic conversation. And I know from the cardiac anesthesia standpoint, we are very hungry to be um, more um, present and, uh, uh, um, and collaborative with you guys, uh, with these patients that are, that are coming to the OR or being assessed for, for coming to the OR. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, no, thank you. I I, I think we, I think we often wish we were on the same server so that we could. Uh, I know. Just, <laughs> I, I know that can't be the case because uh, you were. Um, we kind of had set, um, uh, set reporting systems that we're all used to, and we don't. Both sides don't want to change. So, um, anyways, thanks. Uh, for if you if you could convince them to to change to Philips, I wouldn't be upset. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, no, you know, I Thank think that'd much. be something. That, I think that'd be something uh, important to explore. I think you should be able to see our echoes. Like, not that I think, I know it is important for you to see your echoes. Like if there is a perivalvular leak that, you know, is reasonably significant in our three or six month follow-up for you to be able to look at our echo and be like, oh yeah, there was actually a little bit leak. They missed that. Or they must have decided that, you know, it wasn't significant enough to intervene on. But wow, look at that clinical course. You know, next time we should bring this to their attention. So next time they do see that little paravalvular leak, uh, you know, they might actually want to go back and, and do um, an intervention at that time, or at least flag that patient for maybe more frequent assessments that they might need a percutaneous procedure. Um, so that'll be something I'll, I'll discuss that because I think it is very important uh, for, to see uh, to see interoperative echoes and not just the report, right? But actually looking at the pictures. It's it, we do that. You know, patients come back. Uh, you know, in Boston we had a patient. She had a dislodged aortic valve. Uh, she just had surgery three months ago. We went back to her uh, OR pictures and we're like, oh, yep, there was a little paravalvular leak. Uh, that probably grew and was enough to actually close, cause some flow acceleration to, to dislodge the valve. And then we did, you know, an M&Ms on it. So um, 
yeah, uh, let me explore that because I think it is important for you to be able to see the actual pictures themselves.